Now we're going to turn our attention to a product of two vectors called the dot product. This product is extremely useful and important, and geometrically speaking it gives us a way of talking about lengths and angles of vectors. And just like we found with addition and scalar multiplication, it turns out it's actually pretty straightforward to calculate dot products. The real challenge is in understanding its interpretation. So let's begin by defining the thing. The dot product is a product that takes in two vectors and produces a scalar. That's the first important point to remember. A dot product just gives us a single number, not a new vector back. So here's how it's defined. So let u and v be two vectors in Rn. Then the dot product of u and v, which is written u dot v, is defined to be u dot v equals the vector u1, u2 through to un dot u1, sorry, v1, v2 through to vn, just equals u1, v1 plus u2, v2 plus all the way through to u n v n. So you take your two vectors, you multiply the corresponding elements together and then add them all up. You don't forget to add them at the end. So have a go at these two just to check that you've got it straight. So calculate the dot product of 1, negative 3, 1 and negative 1, negative 1, 1 1.5 and also of 1, negative 1, negative 2 and 2, 2, 0. Right, so the first one, we've got 1 times negative 1 gives us negative 1, plus negative 3 times negative 1, that's plus 2, uh, sorry, plus 3, which gives us 2, and then plus an additional 1 times 1.5 gives us 3.5 for the first one. And for the second, we've got 1, 2 is 2, plus negative 1 times 2 gets us back to 0, plus negative 2 times 0, which gives us 0 overall for the second one. So here's the thing. It's possible to have a dot product equal to zero without one of the vectors themselves equaling zero. This is not how numbers work. Whenever we've got two numbers that multiply to zero, it means that one of them must be. So this is new. So let's have a look at a little demonstration in GeoGebra of the dot product of two vectors in R2. So I've got my vectors A and B, and the number in the bottom left is what the dot product of them is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my vector B around, and notice that this dot product number is changing first of all. I'm going to try and sort of move it around in a bit of a circular shape and watch this dot product. It seems to get to kind of maximum sort of value when the two vectors are lined up. And as I move away, it seems to be going down again. So if I continue on this sort of circular pattern, when I get to about right angles, then my dot product goes to zero. Okay, I wonder if that works on the other side as well. When it's at about at right angles, my dot product goes to zero. Then if I continue around, you notice that if I've got my acute angle, sorry, an obtuse angle between the two things, I, an angle greater than 90 degrees, I get negative numbers from my dot product. So that's important. We'll understand more about these angles later on, but let's just sort of remember for now that we seem to see that this number here, in fact, let's just line these up a little more conveniently. Stick A at two, and if we line it up, the dot product gives us about four. And in fact, it's going to turn out that's the square of the length of this vector, which means I should get 9 in this case here. Another thing to remember is if, the, if they're at right angles, we seem to get 0, no matter how long or short our vector is. Okay, so we'll come back to the angle interpretation a bit later on, but for now let's look at some properties of the dot product that we can use to calculate with them. So we'll take three vectors u, v, and w in Rn, and a and b being scalars, and see if we need those. Here are some properties. First off, u dot v is equal to v dot u. You can take the dot product in either order and you'll get the same answer. The second one is to do with expanding parentheses. Again, u dot v plus w. I can expand out and I get u dot v plus u dot w. Okay, um, if I have a scalar multiplication going on inside there, if I have a times u, dot v, then I can bring the scalar a to the outside, it's the same as a times u dot v. And finally, if I take the dot product with the zero vector, I get zero itself. So we can see that the dot product is pretty compatible with things like expanding parentheses and scalar multiplication. Just remember that whenever you have products of two vectors in this sense, they're always dot products. Right, now what are we going to do with our dot products? First thing we're going to do is we're going to use our dot product to define the length of a vector. This is exactly the kind of length you should expect, like if we measured how long our arrow was with a ruler. We usually call the length of a vector its norm, and we write it as the vector u surrounded by parallel bars. So we define it as follows. Let u be a vector in Rn, then the norm, so we call this the norm, it doesn't always just mean the length, 
which is written, as I just said, is defined to be the norm of u is the square root of the dot product of u with itself, which for us means the square root of u1 squared plus u2 squared all the way through to un squared because u1 v1 becomes u1 squared, etc. Now that first relationship, we often write it in its squared form. We often say that the norm of u squared is equal to the dot product of u with itself. So it's a useful one to remember. So let's use it to find the length of the vector 3, negative 4. If we draw our vector on paper, we can see that its length ought to be 5 by Pythagoras' theorem. Okay, so 5 is the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. It's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. And this is exactly what our formula gives. We get the norm of the vector 3, negative 4. It's just the square root of 3 squared plus negative 4 squared, which is the square root of 9 plus 16, which is the square root of 25, which is 5. Notice that the square root symbol always denotes the positive square root of something. So this means that the length of a vector is always positive or zero, I suppose, when all the entries are zero. We can write that last statement mathematically as the norm of u is greater than, greater than or equal to zero and the norm of u equals zero if and only if u equals zero. If and only if is just another way of saying these are two equivalent statements. So we should check that our definition of length is actually compatible with scalar multiplication because we claimed earlier that scalar multiplication ought to stretch our vectors out and reverse them if negative by the magnitude of the scalar. Okay, we've already said that before we even talked about lengths of vectors. So if we were to make that statement mathematical, we'd say that the norm of a scalar a times a vector u is equal to the absolute value of that scalar a times the norm of the vector u. This is for a vector u and rn and a scalar a from r, the real numbers. The single bars denote the absolute value, which makes a number positive if it's negative, otherwise just leaves it alone. So this is something that we really hope is true, but we don't know it yet, because if it's not true, then I've completely led you down the garden path in our previous video. Luckily, we can use our definition to check it. We'll start with the left-hand side of our formula, and we'll try and make our way to the right. So we'll write down the left-hand side first, the norm of a times u. Well, that equals, I'm just going to substitute in my norm formula and my entries of the vector a times u. So it's going to be the square root of a times u1 squared plus a times u2 squared all the way up to a times un squared. Notice I've put the parentheses around the things so that we square everything together nicely. Now I'm going to expand out those parentheses. So it'll be the square root of a squared u1 squared plus a squared u2 squared all the way through to a squared un squared. I can see a common factor of a squared inside there, so let's just take it out. Uh, it'll be the square root of a squared times u1 squared plus u2 squared all the way through to un squared. Okay, so we just factorise that, taking out the common factor of a squared. Now I know that the square root of a product is the product of the square roots, so that is going to be equal to the square root of a squared times the square root of u1 squared plus u2 squared all the way through to un squared. Now it's tempting to just write that the square root of a squared is a, but that's not necessarily true. If a was equal to negative 3, for example, negative 3 squared would be 9, and the square root of that would be positive 3. So the square root always gives us the positive thing back, so the square root of a squared is actually just another way of writing the absolute value of a. So that equals the absolute value of a times the length of u, we recognize that formula, and so we've proven the result that we hoped was true. That's pretty cool. We've used our definitions of scalar multiplication and length to prove something that we so desperately wanted to be true. It shows us that our understanding of scalar multiplication as a geometrical stretch actually fits with our definition of length. So unit vectors. We often want to create vectors that have length 1 that point in a particular direction, and we call these vectors unit vectors. One way to do this is to just take a vector and divide it by its length. So for example, if our vector has length 2, we're just divide it by 2, I will multiply it by a half, and the result will have length 1. We call this process normalizing the vector. So for example, if I want a vector in the same direction as a vector u equals 2, negative 6, and 3, but with length 1, I'll just do u hat is equal to 1 over the norm of u times u, which is equal to, in our case, 1 over the square root of 2 squared plus negative 6 squared plus 3 squared, 
Don't forget parentheses around the negative numbers so we square them correctly. All times the vector 2, negative 6, 3. So that's a scalar, 1 over the square root of stuff, times the vector 2, negative 6, 3. Continuing on, that equals 1 over the square root of 49, times that vector 2, negative 6, 3. Square root of 49 is 7, and I'll take that factor of a 7th inside my entries. Could leave it outside if you like, it doesn't matter. But that will be 2 sevenths, negative 6 sevenths, and 3 sevenths. It's pretty common to put a little hat on top of a vector to indicate that it's a unit vector, but it's not actually a, a strict rule. Another way of doing this in two dimensions, we may often want to produce a unit vector at an angle of theta, or some angle theta, from the x-axis. So if we draw our vector on the unit circle, we can read off the components and write the vector down as u hat is just equal to cosine theta and sine theta. You can see it from our circle here. In fact, that's pretty much just the definition of what cosine theta and sine theta actually are. Right, so a couple of exercises before we move on. So pause the video and do the following two problems before you go any further. So first I'd like you to find a unit vector in the same direction as the vector negative 5 and 12. And second I'd like you to find a unit vector in R2 oriented at 120 degrees from the positive x-axis. Okay, so let's see if we can work that problem. If I want a unit vector in the same direction as negative 5, 12, I'm just going to first calculate its length and then multiply it by the vector. So if this is my u, then u hat will be 1 over the length of u all times my vector u, which will be 1 over the square root of negative 5 squared plus 12 squared times my vector u, and 5 squared and 12 squared, that sounds a lot like 169, which just so happens to be the square of 13. No coincidence there, funnily enough, which is 1 over 13 times negative uh, 5, 12. I'm going to leave the 13s outside this time just for variation. And for our second one, number 2, we want a unit vector in R2 oriented at 120 degrees from the positive x-axis. So I will just sketch a little picture, even though I could just write the answer straight down. 120 degrees is about that big, our length is going to be 1, so our vector u hat will equal cosine of 120 degrees, sine of 120 degrees, and I'm going to get out my calculator, it's actually a shortcut for this particular problem, but I'm not going to use it, I'll get out my calculator and I'll go, okay, let's, maybe you can see it here, sine of 120 is 0 0.5806, except that I'm in the probably in the wrong mode. So notice in your calculator you will have different modes. I'm going to make sure I'm in degrees mode. It's really important that when we're dealing with angles, we get our calculator in the correct mode. So I'm going to set my angle mode to be degrees, and I'm going to try that again because that number did not look right to me. All right, sine of 120 degrees, calculator says it's 0.866. And like I said, we'll actually do better at calculating these type of things later on. There's, there's actually an exact answer for what that is, but never mind for now. That's my sine, put it in the wrong place, so 0 0.866. Looks good. If you see the picture, we see the, the sine value should be positive and sort of bigger than a half for sure. And now I'll do cosine of 120, and that will give me negative a half, which also looks about right. Okay, and that's to three decimal places. All right, so that wasn't so bad. Okay, so um, hopefully you got those things when you had a go yourself, um, and we'll continue on. Right, what else can we do? So next on our list of interesting things we can achieve is the distance between two points. So remember from previously that we showed that a vector a minus b is a vector connecting two other vectors a and b when they're both drawn starting from the origin. So also remember that vectors starting from the origin can be used to model points. So putting these facts together, we get that the distance between two points is given by the norm of a minus b, where a and b are the vectors representing them. Maybe this is clearest to see in an, in an example. So how far is it between the points 3, 1, 2 and negative 2, 1, 7? 
Well, our distance is just going to be, I'll write those two points down as vectors, see the different notation, as a point I wrote it down in a row with parentheses, as a vector I use these square brackets and write them as a column, so our distance is going to be the norm, or the length, of the vector 3, 1, 2, minus negative 2, negative 1, 7. So that is the norm of the vector 5, 2, negative 5, which is the square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared plus negative 5 squared, which is the square root of 54, and that also happens to be 3 root 6, although we could have probably left it as root 54 if we wanted to. So notice that we wrote the points down as vectors. A question you might ask yourself, and I'll leave you to answer, is will it work the same way as if I wrote the two points down in the opposite order? I.e. Is the, is the norm of b minus a the same as the norm of a minus b? Why or why not? We've actually done what you need to answer this already in this video, so I'll let you have a think about that. Alright, so in our next video, we're going to be talking about angles between vectors. So we're going to do a little bit of a preview of some of what we need for this in this one. Um, we noticed from our earlier demonstration that it appeared that when vectors are at right angles, their dot product is zero. Okay, let's just do that again real quick. If our vectors are at right angles, no matter where I put them, if they're at right angles, their dot product is zero. It's about as zero as I can get here. Okay, this is indeed true, and we, you, we say that the two vectors are orthogonal if their dot product is zero. So our definition would be let a and b be vectors in Rn, and we say that a and b are orthogonal if a dot b is equal to zero. So when you hear the word orthogonal, think at right angles. We can use this idea to generalize Pythagoras' theorem to use for vectors. So remember, regular Pythagoras' theorem says that if we have a right angle triangle with sides a and b at right angles, then the hypotenuse c is satisfies a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So the vector version of this is that if the vectors u and v are orthogonal at right angles, then if we draw them head to tail, the vector u plus v then forms the hypotenuse of a right angled triangle, well sort of, because this works in higher dimensions than 3, but you can still think of it as a triangle. And Pythagoras' theorem should therefore say that the norm of u plus v squared, that's the hypotenuse squared, should equal the norm of u squared plus the norm of v squared. Okay, the length, the squares are the lengths of the other two sides. Now we, can't, we, do, we don't know this for sure yet, we haven't proven it, but it turns out we can prove this quite easily, and it's a good way to practice using lots of the tools from today. So to prove it, we'll just start at the left hand side and we'll use our new tools to work our way to the right. So, the norm of u plus v squared, now that's a norm, a norm squared can be written as a dot product of something with itself, so that equals u plus v dot u plus v. Now I've got some parentheses to expand, so let's practice doing that. That will be u dot u, remember all the products are dot products, plus u dot v, plus v dot u, plus v dot v. So just expand it out our brackets using FOIL or whatever other method you may be comfortable with. Now I can see that u dot u and v dot v, they are just the length of u squared and the length of v squared that I actually want in my end result. And then I've got, also notice that u dot v and v dot u are actually the same thing, that was one of our properties. So I can rewrite this as the length of u squared plus 2 times u dot v plus the length of v squared. Finally, um, this is true in general, but if our vectors are orthogonal, that little piece of extra information is that u dot v is equal to 0. So that middle term is going to disappear, and overall that equals u squared plus v squared. So we are geniuses, we just proved Pythagoras' theorem for vectors. Alright, so we can use this for example to show that our formula produces the correct length of vectors in R3. Maybe I'll leave that one as an exercise for you to have a look at. So what have we done? We've introduced the dot product, and we've learned how to calculate it. We've discovered that it, can de that it defines the length or norm of a vector. And we also discovered that the dot product has something to do with the angles between vectors. Um, in particular, we introduced the concept of orthogonality, which is when vectors have a dot product of zero. I think that's ample for today, so we'll see you next time.